This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the BCHA or its board of directors. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. Welcome everyone. I'm glad uh, so many people could come out on this snowy day. Um, I left early, luckily, because I had to shovel my driveway, so I made it. So yes, the Trump apocalypse. It was a very, very sad and horrific day. Uh, the election night. I still remember it. You know, everyone was ready for a big celebration. It was like such a letdown. It was like felt like a felt like a death. Uh, and I think you know, as a woman, and how it might impact women's rights is really um, one of the biggest things, I think. When I was researching this um, presentation, I wanted to talk about women's rights in general, not just reproductive rights, but virtually all the coverage uh, really focused on reproductive rights as the most clear and present danger with the Trump presidency. So uh, let's begin, and I should mention, um, I don't have much in the way of graphics, and um, so it's a lot of some facts and information, for those of you who can't really see the screen very well, I'll try and read it out or explain each point. And then uh, at the end, um, I, my last slide is to do with sort of asking questions, uh, what's really going to happen and what do we do about it, and hopefully we can spark a little discussion about that because, of course, who knows what's really going to happen. Trump is so unpredictable. So I see the election as a huge loss uh, for all women. Uh, one thing about Hillary Clinton, her name and her whole candidacy was really a synonymous with a push for um, stronger women's rights. And she had been Secretary of State and had been really pushing women's rights throughout her tenure and had made all these campaign promises. And we were so looking forward to this um, fantastic agenda that would really put women's rights on the, on the global stage for the first time. And the fact that she lost to a blatant sexist who showed contempt for women uh, is especially galling, um, almost humiliating, really, uh, for Hillary and for women. It was a, a true backlash that legitimizes misogyny. So it, it was huge symbolism. Like, like if she, she would have been, been the first woman president of the United States, and she lost. And her um, at the at her planned celebration night, the night of the election, she booked this huge hall with a glass ceiling for the symbolism, right? And then she didn't even uh, come out that night to talk. I think there's a, a, a role model effect lost in terms of uh, you know women, women and girls having someone to look up to. The hope and optimism for uh, the prospects for women's um, uh, achievements is kind of diminished now, not just in the U.S. but even around the world. There's a loss of hope for any foreign policy where women's rights um, might be enshrined in laws and values. It's going to signal a stagnation and probably even a retreat on um, women's rights and equality around the globe. In other words, what we have now is not going to get any better and probably could get worse. Uh, so current work and programs improving women's uh, health and lives and safety um, are going to be undermined, so maybe cut back. And I think under Trump there's going to be a, a greatly increased threat of war uh, as well as environmental degradation, you think of his stance on climate change, and I think he still thinks it's like a hoax or something. And uh, war and uh, environmental problems have a generally far more devastating cons consequences for women and children, I believe, because women are more um, tend to be living more in poverty. Uh, women are often victims of sexual violence during war uh, and things of that nature. So uh, I wanted to run through some of it just to remind you of just how bad Trump has been. And I've kind of compiled a lot of his uh, record just to sort of keep it all fresh in your minds and you probably maybe a few things you haven't heard. So here's what Trump has said about Clinton uh, during the campaign. He said, uh, frankly, if Hillary Clinton were a man, I don't think she'd get 5% of the vote. The only thing she's got going is the woman's card. In one of the debates, he said, such a nasty woman. And that sort of uh, precipitated uh, a meme around people being proud to, you know, I'm a nasty woman, the t-shirts and everything. 
At his rallies, he allowed his supporters to stoke violence against her. You probably all heard about, you know, the cries of lock her up and um, some really horrible imagery and the things that were going on at the rallies. In one of his rallies, um, he joked that only Second Amendment people, uh, he's talking about uh, people supporting gun rights in the U.S., could stop Clinton from appointing anti-gun judges to the Supreme Court. So it's basically like a, a not very subtly cloaked invitation to assassinate her. And at another uh, uh, rally, he said he suggested that her Secret Service detail should stop carrying guns. And then uh, let's see what happens to her. Just unbelievable rhetoric coming from a presidential candidate is just absolutely shameful and hugely frightening. So here are some things that Trump has said about women. In the past, he's called women pigs, slobs, dogs. He's got a habit of reducing half the population to a hotness score, so he rates them on their attractiveness. And if you look at his entourage and everyone, um, he basically usually just hires really attractive women. He bragged about how he could sexually assault women and then dismissed it as locker room talk. I'm sure you all remember the huge media coverage that got with the release of the Access Hollywood tapes. You know, at the time, I thought, wow, this is it. This is going to just do him in. But unfortunately, that happened like a month before the election, and things had died down, and people started to forget about it. And it was really depressing to see even women, 52% um, of white women, voting in favor of Trump in spite of all that, you know, as if sexual assault against women doesn't really matter, I guess. He told a breastfeeding mother at one of his rallies, you're disgusting. I think at one of the early uh, debates with the Republican candidates, Fox News anchor Megyn Kelly challenged Trump about some of his past misogynistic statements. So he called her unprofessional for asking that question, and then said, you can see there was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. Just a really disgraceful, debasing comment about, uh, about women. And he said of a Republican presidential candidate, Carly Fior Fiorina, Fiorina, I don't know how to pronounce it, look at that face. Would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that, the face of our next president? And he also said, by the way, that you know, Hillary Clinton is not presidential, or doesn't look presidential. What does that mean? I mean, well, there's been no women, woman president before, so how does a woman, first woman president supposed to look presidential according to past standards? It was just a really stupid comment, and I think indicated um, sexism inherent sexism in his remarks. And once on his reality TV show, Celebrity Apprentice, he said to a female contestant, must be a pretty picture, you dropping to your knees. So what has he said about abortion? Kind of a gold mine here, unfortunately. In the late 1990s, he described himself as very pro-choice, although later he qualified that by saying, he meant it in a meek fashion, whatever that means. Well, he did say that he didn't like abortion, but he supported um, choice. But he now says his views has, have evolved, and I am pro-life. And he attributes his uh, conversion to um, just personal stories. You know, a friend who, um, his friend's wife had been considering an abortion, but changed their mind, and now, hey, that kid is fantastic. And, and, um, and another guy who was also considering abortion, a friend, and they didn't, and now the child is the apple of his eye, and... I mean, you can't use these personal examples to, <laughs> to decide that you're against choice for all women. It's just um, crazy. Then he said he, there has to be some form of punishment for women who have illegal abortions. And he later retracted that and says that only providers will be punished. And I, find, I found that, that whole um, incident really, really galling because, um, for one thing, there is all kinds of uh, punishment already for women who have abortions, and I'll get into that later in another slide. And uh, the other thing that I found really um, outrageous was that the anti-choice movement really responded to that comment like, oh, no, no way, we don't want to punish women for having abortions, that's completely against everything we stand for, and they forced Trump to back down with this line, you know, our real uh, line is that only providers that should be criminalized, you know, trying to take the blame off women, because why? Because women are not responsible for their moral choices, they're like children, so we can't blame them, you know, or they're forced or coerced into abortion, so we can't blame them. It's just very insulting, I think, for to women. I mean, if you believe abortion is murder, then women are murderers, and why not just admit that? But of course, it's very hypocritical, the anti-choice, because they do punish women for abortions. He says uh, that Roe v. Wade, and that's the decision that legalized abortion in all 50 states in 1973, 
was wrongly decided and he wants to see it changed and he's going to appoint pro life judges to the supreme court and all he has to do is appoint two or three and uh because i think two of the liberal judges are over 80 now and could retire hopefully they're going to now hang on for a few more years but you know anything can happen they're elderly so um it's um it's uh, very worrisome so just two or three judges would tip the court to a basically a majority of right-wing extremists most of them catholic and uh, we can certainly cannot depend on them to vote according to the law and precedent. Then uh, he said that um, he promised to that he will I will protect protect it set the sanctity of life, and the biggest way you can protect it is by electing me president. He acknowledged that if Roe v. Wade were overturned, that the it would go back to the states to um, legislate it as they pleased or criminalize it. So what would happen to women who won't be able to get an abortion? He was challenged on that. He says, yeah, well, I guess uh, perhaps I'll have to go to another state. So he understands you know, the, the implications, what would happen, but he has no clue really about the, the real world effects it's, it's going to have on women and how, uh, especially poor women, women of color, women who can't travel, it's going to deny access to so many women and create so much hardship. He asserted that under current abortion law, and um, you may have heard this in one of the present presidential debates. I heard it, and it's, oh, my God. He said, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb at the ninth month on the final day. I mean, that's just total BS. It does not happen that way. Only 1.3% of abortions in the U.S. occur at 21 weeks of pregnancy or later. And in, in the third trimester, generally only for non-viable pregnancies where the fetus is not going to survive after birth. And 43 states already prohibit abortion after a specific time in pregnancy. So it's pretty much already uh, prohibited, except um, in those extreme cases. Um, I mean, if something happens to a woman, like with a wanted pregnancy, where she has uh, some serious complications later in pregnancy, they don't do an abortion, they just have an early delivery, or cesarean section. He's promised to sign a federal ban on abortion after 20 weeks. And that would be based on the scientifically unproven argument that after 20 weeks, fetuses can feel pain. And this bans, um, it bans abortion before many women can even learn about the fetal anomalies, because sometimes the tests don't happen until 22, 23, 24 weeks. And um, right now, as, as the Roe v. Wade decision guarantees access to abortion up to 24 weeks. So a ban on abortion at 20 weeks would be unconstitutional. It would trigger a, a Supreme Court challenge which is what they want, because they want it to go up to the court with a majority of anti-choice judges. And he plans to defund Planned Parenthood, basically totally, and 40% of Planned Parenthood's funding comes from government grants. And he said that Planned Parenthood is like an abortion factory. Even though in the past he said supportive comments about Planned Parenthood, because of course they provide many other, other services besides abortion, um, all kinds of reproductive health care, and in fact no federal funds uh, go to Planned Parenthood for abortion, only for other health care, like, you know, pap smears, uh, breast cancer screenings, and that kind of thing. So this is what's at stake, he basic health care for women. And many women actually use, go to Planned Parenthood clinics for their basic health care, just to, you know, if they have a cold or whatever, they go to Planned Parenthood, because care is free. So since the election, there's been, a, or even before the election, there's been an increase in threats against abortion providers. And I'll just read this quote. Uh, it's from uh, Camille Barbone, who's the Vice President of Operations at Choices Women's Medical Center in Jamaica, New York. And New York is a very liberal city. They don't usually have a lot of problems with protesters. This was just recently, December 15th. Their behavior, she's talking about the anti-choice protesters outside her clinic, their behavior has become incredibly more aggressive to the point we've had to call the police the last three to four weeks. There's much more condemnation than I've ever seen before. They're pushing cell phone cameras into patients' faces. So here they are, like, actually filming patients and, you know, yelling at them and saying often quite nasty things. Just since the election night alone, a Kentucky clinic had to replace its windows after a protester threw rocks through them. A clinic in North Carolina saw 2,500 protesters on one day holding Trump and Pence signs saying, We won, you lost. Online threats against abortion providers in November more than tripled the yearly average. Okay, so in one month, triple the number of threats compared to the entire year average. 
That's um, um, from Vicki Saporta, president of National Abortion Federation, and they keep lots of stats on um, anti-choice violence and harassment. Many states, including Texas, Ohio, Indiana, and Oklahoma, have introduced uh, uh, anti-abortion bills, including bans on abortion as early as six weeks before a woman would even know that she's pregnant. It's called like the heartbeat bill in Ohio. You may have heard about that, but luckily the um, governor of Ohio vetoed that bill, but he signed a bill banning abortions after 20 weeks. And uh, there was a bill in Texas to um, require clinics and women to either bury or cremate fetal remains. And that would basically increase the cost of an abortion by $1,500 per, per woman. I think that law in Texas has been um, temporarily blocked by the courts, but it has to go to court now. And the antitrust movement has promised that in 2017 there's going to be a huge onslaught of bills restricting abortion in many states, because they basically have carte blanche now. And another thing they're doing is that they're continuing that um, taxpayer-funded witch hunt into the uh, so-called criminal behavior of Planned Parenthood. I don't know how many of you were at my session last year where I talked about the Center for Medical Progress and those uh, propaganda videos claiming to show Planned Parenthood selling uh, fetal body parts, which is totally untrue. The videos were uh, heavily edited. But there's a whole congressional investigation going on, even now, continuing, and they spent like a couple of million dollars on it already. Um, and it's, it's, like, it's like, it's it's McCarthyism happening all over again. It's just ridiculous what's going on there. So since the election, there's been a huge increase in threats uh, against women and other and, and minorities. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a group that tracks um, hate crimes and hate groups, they counted 867 hate incidents across the U.S. just in the 10 days after the election. Some of the targets were, uh, primary targets were Muslim women wearing hijabs. They were particularly vulnerable, uh, like people coming by and just yanking off their hijab. And harassment and crimes against Hispanic Americans, uh, black people, visible minorities and immigrants, and the LGBT community. And many of those were involved women and sexual threats against them. I think uh, you know women are considered if you if you're feeling um, there's an atmosphere that gives you license to engage in this behavior, you target the most vulnerable people, which are often women and women of color. You know, even, if, even before Trump signs a single law, uh, like he's not even president yet, but the media acts like he is, uh, he's already influenced the level of sexist and racist discourse in the U.S. I've got a quote here uh, from Francis Rade, a, a law professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, and she says, the way in which he dismisses women feeds into misogyny in a way we have not seen since the 1960s. The fact that this has appeared in the United States, a leader on the world stage, is threatening for the global women's movement. I totally agree. So what is he going to do to help women? There's been very, very little uh, about that in the media. In the past, he's called pregnancy, uh, referring to uh, the need to give women maternal leave from work, an inconvenience for business. Uh, it looks like now Ivanka Trump, his daughter, is going to be like the first lady uh, taking on a huge role in the White House. So her maternal leave plan is only for uh, six weeks. It's limited to legally married women, excludes fathers, same-sex partners, and ma any male couples. So it's a very uh, exclusionary and limited plan, kind of based along traditional lines. I guess it's better than nothing, but it's really far short of what is needed. And that's really about the only thing he, uh, they've come up with in terms of you know um, helping women or improving women's rights. Um, it's unclear how the Trumps plan to deal with uh, child care or uh, pay equity issues, if at all. Uh, and there's a rather poor track record on those issues in their own businesses. Um, so let's take a look at Trump's cabinet picks. Um, it's a huge, uh, scary mess. Vice President-elect Mike Pence. He's the current governor of Indiana. I think maybe he's already resigned. I'm not sure. He has a long history. He's like one of the most extreme anti-choice politicians ever in the United States. Like he's the worst. So for people who hope that maybe you know Trump will resign or he'll go away and he won't be president anymore, well, say hello to Mike Pence because he'll be the next president and he may be even worse. He authored one of the first bills to strip all federal funding from Planned Parenthood when he was in Congress. 
He signed multiple anti-abortion bills into law as governor of Indiana, um, including an unprecedented measure to ban abortion in cases of genetic abnormality. And when I say multiple, like it just runs the gamut of, the, of every bill you can imagine. And he said that Roe v. Wade belongs on the ash heap of history. And he's very, very gung-ho of getting Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade overturned and probably have a huge say in who gets appointed to the Supreme Court. It's important to remember that like, we might dismiss Trump as uninformed, inexperienced, but he's got these, these advisors who um, have been in politics for a while, some of them, and know their way around and have an extreme right-wing agenda. And um, he's going to let them just run amok and do what they want. Jeff Sessions is an Alabama senator, and he's a nominee for attorney general. He advocates defunding organizations that perform abortions. He supported bans on various abortion procedures, and he voted against a security and safety fund for women's health care clinics. Let the terrorists rule. Uh, Tom Price is a nominee for health and human services. He ardently opposes abortion and the Affordable Care Act's no-cost birth control mandate. He even said, had the gall to say uh, on the media recently, there's not one woman who can't afford contraception. Like naive, uh, ignorant, I don't know what the word is to describe that, it's just totally irresponsible. And of course he has a 100% anti-voting record, anti-choice voting record. I just wanted to give you a bit more flavor of Mike Pence and some of the things he's done. He is a born again evangelical Catholic, uh, and he has said, um, when uh, asked about you know the, the role, his public role. He says, for me, my faith informs my life. So he's right out front about his religion uh, influencing his decisions. So some of the laws he's uh, signed in, in Indiana, um, criminalizing fetal tissue collection or transferring. So basically cutting off research using fetal uh, tissue, even though that's extremely important. Uh, he's required women to view the fetal ultrasound hours before receiving an abortion. There was, a, there was a campaign, like that law was so far reaching that women in Indiana began um, calling Pence's office to uh, tell, them about, tell them about their periods. Because, you know, he's an expert on women's rights and women's health, so and he seems to care about it so much, so maybe he can help, right? Um, and he has already defunded Planned Parenthood in Indiana, and that resulted in the closure of multiple clinics there. In 2015, it actually created an HIV outbreak in one Indiana town because their clinic had closed there. Of course, many clinics provide more than you know abortion or contraceptive care. They provide a range of care, so suddenly people couldn't get HIV care or treatment, so um, yeah. He also has a history of making anti, uh, or sorry, homophobic comments, who is anti-gay as well. He said that uh, same-sex couples are a sign of societal collapse, and he voted against repealing the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. So it's important to remember that all these guys, it's not just women's rights, anti-abortion, it's also anti-gay, it's the whole right-wing agenda. And he also voted against, in, in, in federal Congress, he voted against uh, a Fair Pay Act, calling for equal pay for women, uh, three times. A few more um, illustrious people from Trump's incoming cabinet. Mike Pompeo is the un incoming CIA director. He voted against reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act in 2013. Um, because, you know, beating women, that's a right-wing tradition, I guess. Elaine Chao is a nominee for Transportation Secretary, and she opposed the uh, Paycheck Fairness Act to strengthen federal equal pay laws for women. And she also opposed raising the minimum wage during the uh, Bush administration. Betsy DeVos, a uh, nominee for Education Secretary and uh, heir to the Amway fortune, opponent of abortion, strong opponent of abortion, and LGBT rights as well as public education. So she's, she's the education secretary, but she's against public education. So you're going to see the introduction of uh, voucher programs uh, and a lot more power uh, for uh, Christian church, uh, Christian schools, and less accountability, like you know, uh, removal of um, national standards for, for education for kids. Nikki Haley is a nominee for ambassador to the United Nations. And as governor of South Carolina, she signed a bill banning abortions from 20 weeks. As I mentioned, that's unconstitutional. Ben Carson, who was one of the Republican um, candidates for president, and really said some crazy things. He's actually a, a brain surgeon, but now we know that you know, it, you know that myth about you don't have to be a brain surgeon to, to be dumb, right, or, or something. Or so he's a longtime abortion foe. Okay, 
So I want to talk about the global gag rule. Has anyone here heard of the global gag rule? Okay. Um, it's a long-standing policy uh, implemented in 1984 by Ronald Reagan. It prohibits NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that receive U.S. aid funding from providing abortions or even counseling patients or referring them, even using their own money. So NGOs can't even engage in advocacy when they're within their own countries, for example, to try and liberalize their um, criminal abortion laws. So it completely silences um, um, NG NGOs. If they want to get U.S. money, they can't do anything or say anything about abortion at all. They can't help women in their own countries. So it's been a back and forth political football, uh, kind of like a traditional first step for incoming presidents. And so I predict that within the first day or two, um, you'll see this global gag rule being signed back into law again by new President Trump. So President Bill Clinton revoked it uh, right after taking office. President George W. Bush reinstated it shortly after his inauguration. And President Barack Obama revoked the policy as soon as he entered the White House. So it is actually it's a policy, not a law. So when it's enforced, uh, the global gag rule has led to the closure of many family planning programs uh, around the world, like in developing countries, and women's clinics, or they've had to reduce their staff and programs. It actually decreases access to basic health care for women as well as contraception. As I mentioned, like clinics often provide more than just abortion care, but in developing countries, the clinic is like, is like just one clinic in the village, and they provide everything. And so... Um, it can force the closure of entire clinics for entire communities and uh, the cutbacks of care, basic uh, primary care, especially for women, including like childbirth care and everything else. And there's already, you know, so many women dying in, uh, from you know, maternal mortality from childbirth is still pretty high. So the global gag rule um, it consistently leads, when it's enforced, it leads to an increase in unsafe abortions and maternal death. So during the Bush era, the eight years of George W. Bush, Abortion rates more than doubled in African countries most reliant on U.S. funds. And that's just an effect of, you know, uh, having much less access to health care and to contraception. That increases the unintended pregnancy rate. And then they can't get, uh, you know, safe abortion care, so they have unsafe abortions and more women die. I think really that the goal of the global gag rule is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's deliberate. They're trying to reduce access to reproductive health care as much as possible around the world for women. It's not just about, we don't want to fund abortion, it's just we don't want to, you know, we don't want to help women. It's, it's unfortunate that abortion, everything else around, all women's health care gets tainted by abortion and gets uh, reduced because of that. So the Helms Amendment is another example of a global um, policy or law. I'm not sure whether it's a law or policy. It's, um, it was passed in 1973, so it's over... 40 years old. It bans the use of U.S. funds for abortion in other countries. So this is talking about like American groups who are uh, spending money in, in foreign countries, the U.S. foreign aid. So the law actually says no foreign assistance funds may be used to pay for the performance of abortion as a method of family planning or to motivate or coerce any person to practice abortions. So this phrase, as a method of family planning, is kind of like a meaningless thing. What does that really mean? Um, it seems to mean that at least women should be able to get funded abortions for rape, uh, incest, if their life is in danger. But in practice, no. Um, no abortion care is funded at all uh, because of this amendment. And the USAID, which is the governing funding organization, uh, misinterprets the amendment. So, uh, and they also do not support the purchase of equipment or commodities, commodities that could be used to perform abortions or provide post-abortion care. So this really leaves women in the lurch. Even women who are raped cannot get abortion care. Even women who have unsafe abortion and go to a hospital uh, are, are left untreated. They won't even treat them sometimes. They're turned away. Because, of course, uh, many people in these countries, the healthcare personnel, are also afraid of getting arrested. They don't want to be seen uh, to be breaking the law. And there's so much stigma. It's still a source of shame. So it's like okay to turn women away and to you know uh, heap judgment upon them. So what is the cost of the Helms Amendment? Well, there's 22 million unsafe abortions a year in developing countries, almost all in developing countries, and 22,000 women die each year, which is a lot. Now, you may have heard other previous estimates back in the 90s. The estimate was 68,000 women a year. In 2008, they reduced that down to 47,000 a year. Now it's 22,000. That's a new estimate from last year from the World Health Organization. 
I actually talked to the woman who wrote, who was lead, led the study, and said, so this is an actual real reduction? And she said, we don't know. Uh, all we know is that the numbers before were wrong. And now we've uh, upgraded our methodology, we have more sources, and this is the new accurate, most accurate number we can come up with. I think it does probably represent a reduction, though. But you can see, um, there's still a lot of unsafe abortions, as many as there ever were, even more. And more than 7 million women suffer complications, but 3 million never receive care. So that's the, uh, it's actually an increase in, in the number of complications uh, in, uh, for unsafe abortion. What I think is happening is that more and more women, especially in Latin America, are turning to the use of abortion pills, getting them through the mail or uh, the black market or through their local pharmacy. And this method is much, much safer than, you know, like using a coat hanger or jumping off a roof or whatever uh, methods that women used in the past. So women are still suffering complications because there's uh, less mild complications like extra bleeding and things like that, so they might go to the hospital, but they're not dying from them as much as they used to anymore. So the death rate has greatly reduced, which is a good thing, great thing, but you know we still have criminal abortion laws and um, women are still uh, being treated badly. So it's quite unacceptable. And the number of 22,000 is still way too high. The Hyde Amendment is another um, law or bill. It's uh, domestic, just for domestic United States. It's a funding appropriations bill. People are always getting confused between Hyde and Helms because it's like both four letter H words, but <laughs> they're quite different. It's a funding appropriations bill that prohibits federal funding from being used to pay for elective abortions within the U US. So it was passed in 1976 and introduced by an anti-choice legislator, Henry Hyde, uh, who basically said something at the time like, um, I would like to prevent um, every woman from getting a, an abortion if I could, but the only vehicle is this bill, so at least I'll stop poor women from having you know, funded abortions. Um, so it's been reapproved by every Congress since then. I think there was a well-known case uh, just a year or so later where a poor woman, a, a, a Mexican-American woman, died uh, from an unsafe abortion because she couldn't afford uh, a legal safe abortion. So it has killed women. Now, um, basically it just uh, means that poor women can't get abortions paid through Medicaid. Now, the state governments can opt to fund abortions through their own Medicaid programs, but only 17 states do so. Four just stepped up to the plate and did it voluntarily. That includes Hawaii, Maryland, New York, and Washington. But 13 uh, would not do so until they were forced to do so by a court decision. So there are 17 states that fund it, but that's still a minority of states. And what's really um, sad is that the Democrats and Hillary Clinton had finally, for the first time ever, made a campaign promise to repeal the Hyde Amendment. It would have been gone. So as, as I mentioned, it has to be reapproved by every Congress that comes in because it's not an actual permanent law. But now it's probably going to happen because the Repub Republicans will make it into a permanent law. And that will make it harder to uh, get rid of in the future. So what are the effects of the Hyde Amendment? I mentioned it denies funding to poor women for abortion through Medicaid, except for the usual exceptions of life endangerment, rape, and incest. So this affects mostly women of color. Uh, but what happens in the non-funded states, the majority of non-funded states, which um, generally are the most, you know, the right-wing states, the poorer states down in the south, 18 to 35 percent of uh, women who are eligible for Medicaid have been forced to carry their pregnancies to term. They just can't afford an abortion. And for those who, who could uh, afford an abortion to pay for it, nearly 60 percent of the women on Medicaid were forced to divert money from funds that they needed for rent or utility bills, or food and clothing for their families. So it's really an extreme hardship for the most vulnerable of women. And also it causes many women to delay their abortions, uh, in incre which increases the medical risks the longer you wait you know, while they're trying to scrape together the money. And a common story you hear is that uh, like a first trimester abortion costs maybe five or six hundred dollars. So they're scraping together the money for that. But it takes them like a month or six weeks to get the money together. And by that time, they were into the second trimester and suddenly the bill is like two thousand dollars or more to get a second trimester abortion. And it just really it means a lot of women just can't even get an abortion. So it's not just uh, poor women on Medicaid. There's others that are denied access to federally funded abortion under the Hyde Amendment, and that include uh, all Native Americans, federal employees and their dependents, Peace Corps volunteers, low-income residents of Washington, D.C., which is kind of 
run by the federal government, federal prisoners, military personnel and their dependents, and disabled women who rely on Medicare. So when you think about the populations of the number of poor women and add in all these other people and their dependents, you were talking a lot of people who are being um, denied abortion funding and even access to abortion because of that. A couple other programs or laws that um, affect uh, abortion funding, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP as it's called, it provides expanded health insurance to children under 19, but it bans the use of federal funds for elective abortion. And that reminds me, I think there's been some attempts over the years to include fetuses in, in that uh, program. Uh, in other words, you know, health care for fetuses, but of course not for the pregnant woman. The Balanced Budget Act of 1997 permits health maintenance organizations, they're called HMOs in the states, who serve Medicaid recipients to not fund counseling or referrals for any services on, that they object to on moral or religious grounds. So of course that's usually abortion or contraception. So I mentioned earlier that the um, United States uh, hypocritically, the anti-choice movement claims that they don't want to punish women for abortion, but it's already happening. The National Advocates for Pregnant Women is a fantastic organization in the United States that looks out for the rights of pregnant women and they intervene on behalf of them in court. They've done a lot of great research, and they've identified at least 800 cases between 1973 and 2015 involving the arrests, detentions, or equivalent deprivations of uh, pregnant women's physical liberty. So basically, because you're pregnant, you suddenly have fewer rights, and uh, the, the real concern is the welfare of the fetus. In Alabama, conservatives on the Supreme Court have been using drug laws as a testing ground for anti-abortion personhood arguments. So in other words, um, it's against the law to give drugs to a minor. Guess who's a minor? Fetuses. So if a woman takes any drugs during her pregnancy, suddenly she's guilty of trafficking drugs to a minor. So uh, 479 pregnant women have been prosecuted for chemical endangerment of a fetus since 2006. And so a lot of women, especially in the South, are actually drug tested when they're going to have their babies. And if they have anything in their system, it could be even something like a Valium or something, they come under suspicion. In 2013, Purvi Patel of Indiana, an Indian American woman, was sentenced to 20 years in prison for inducing an abortion. So not for murder, for actually inducing an abortion herself. She had ordered abortion pills from the internet, but it was never proved that she even took them. She claimed to have a miscarriage. And there was other shenanigans at the trial. They used this outdated, uh, disproven test trying to show that the, the child was born alive, and that there was no evidence that was. So she served two years before her conviction was finally overturned um, fairly recently, just about six months ago, I think. A really terrible case. And now, just recently, this year, Anna Yoka of Tennessee, she sought help from a hospital earlier this year when she attempted to terminate a late-term pregnancy using a coat hanger in her bathtub she was charged with first-degree murder, but that was later reduced. I think that speaks to the degree of desperation that some women um, get to in states like Tennessee, where access is really uh, poor. And then in 2014, Jennifer Whalen, uh, a low-income Pennsylvania mother, was jailed for up to 18 months just because she ordered abortion pills for her teenage daughter on the Internet. Uh, the problem was they couldn't afford an abortion. They did the research and tried. But the closest abortion clinic was 75 miles away, and there was a state law that required two separate visits, and they would have had to arrange hotel stays and everything. They just couldn't afford it. So she found a, in a site on the internet that ordered abortion pills, oh, I'll do this, and she didn't, she didn't even realize it was illegal, and now she's in jail. I think she's been released now. And I have many more cases. I guess I won't go through them all. I printed out like a list of 10 or 12 other cases, just... It goes on and on and on, like from the National Abortion, uh, National um, Association for Pregnant Women. I'll just give you a couple, maybe. In Iowa, a pregnant woman who fell down a flight of stairs, accidentally, was reported to the police after seeking help at a hospital because she was arrested for attempted fetal homicide. So this is a thing, like, most women are caught when they go to a hospital with complications or something. But the thing is, too, that if, if abortion is criminalized, and especially um, nowadays with the abortion pills, it's actually impossible to tell the difference between a miscarriage and an abortion by pills. So if abortion is criminalized, if you have any kind of pregnancy complication or a miscarriage, you're going to be under suspicion for criminal abortion. And this happens in many countries around the world, like um, El Salvador in particular, but other countries as well. 
And here's another example. In Louisiana, a woman went to the hospital for unexplained vaginal bleeding. She was locked up for over a year on charges of second-degree murder before medical records revealed that she had suffered a miscarriage at 11 weeks of pregnancy. It's really tragic and depressing to even be talking about this. Maybe I should give you a couple other examples from other countries. Um, in Ecuador, if women are convicted of ending a pregnancy, they can face up to five years in prison. Um, evidence can be pretty thin. Uh, a woman was sentenced uh, to up to two years behind bars based solely on the testimony of a medical professional who says she had an abortion. I mean, people can say anything. And of course, doctors are given a lot more credibility than women are. So turning to contraceptive coverage, uh, you probably heard in the media about how Trump is going to repeal and replace um, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And one of the uh, key sticking points for Republicans in that bill is that it provides contraceptive coverage for women. But on, on a larger scale, uh, losing that or even losing part of it uh, means loss of insurance for up to 22 million people that are currently uh, have obtained coverage through the act. And of course, loss of contraception coverage, but not just that, loss of maternity coverage as well. So one of the big things that the act did was uh, erase the discrimination that uh, insurance companies were um, imposing onto women, higher fees and things like that. So that might all come back. And also on the chopping block are the federal subsidies, the tax credits for low and middle income Americans. So ironically, the, the, many of the people, the people, especially in the poor South, who the white people who voted for Trump, um, they're going to lose their health insurance. So what also might be um, cut back is the, uh, the mandatory nature of Obamacare, where people have to pay in, or if they don't, they're subject to a tax penalty. They pretty much have to have everyone paying into the system to make it economically feasible. And then the insurability for individuals with pre-existing conditions. And I think Trump has made some noises about it. Yeah, he's backtracked on that. But who knows what will really happen, you know? Uh, in the past few years, um, the anti-choice movement has been very successful at depriving women of contraception based on their religious freedom arguments. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that kind of argument. And it was uh, the biggest, most well-known case was the Hobby Lobby case, 2013, I think. So that's a big chain, chain store in the United States owned by evangelical Christians. So the religious owners of the store were against birth control and said, you know, the company has a, a religious beliefs uh, against abortion. They refused to provide coverage to their employees. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and um, they won, Hobby Lobby won. And um, so basically it's like you know, a, a company giving given more constitutional rights as a person. This time the company has religious beliefs. The Supreme Court even accepted um, the Hobby Lobby's false claim Factual, this is a factual claim that's subject to evidence and can be disproven. In fact, it is disproven that some contraceptives were abortifacients. So that was, that instead of just saying that's not true based on scientific evidence, the Supreme Court basically said, well, that's a protected religious belief and that's none of our business. We can't, you know, we can't say anything about that. So they went on that basis. And that was a very scary thought that courts don't have to pay any attention to scientific evidence. All they have, they could just except on face value with the assertions of the plaintiffs, no matter how absurd or, or false they are. So what are women doing in response to um, President-elect Trump? Well, as soon as the election happened, uh, Planned Parenthood uh, got flooded with an unprecedented amount of donations. Like, you know, they, they get a lot of donations, but they, um, they got more than ever before in a short period of time from over 80,000 people. I don't even, can you imagine how much money that was. Millions, probably. And many of them were sent in Vice President-elect Mike Pence's name because all Planned Parenthood supporters know that he's a huge anti-abortion foe. Um, there's been a huge increase in women getting long-acting birth control methods, such as IUDs, uh, because it's currently covered under the Affordable Care Act, but it may not be in the future. And of course, IUDs are quite expensive. You know, they can be like $1,000 or $1,500 to get one inserted. So. Um, there's a rush to get that done in time, um, but there's still there's hope as well. Like a lot of um, when I read um, what women are saying, there's a stronger urge than ever to, to fight back, you know, not to give up and to fight back. So Destiny Lopez, who's the co-director of All Above All, and that's a network of reproductive rights advocates, leading the push. They were leading the push to repeal the Hyde Amendment. And almost got there. She said, the election really brought a daunting challenge to our doorstep that we women, low-income people, people of color, immigrants, 
we're used to fighting against impossible odds. And what are abortion advocates doing? Uh, fighting back hard, vowing to keep the clinic doors open. Planned Parenthood has said, we're not going away, we're not going anywhere, we're gonna stay open, we're gonna keep operating. And uh, as I mentioned, 40% of their funding currently comes from government grants, but they're gonna have to turn to the private sector, and so far, they've opened up their wallets, so that's a good thing. And there may be other foundation money that they could tap as well, hopefully. Warren Buffett is a billionaire, and he's very uh, left-wing, and he supports a lot of uh, progressive causes, including reproductive rights. So we do have at least one big advantage going into this uh, Trump presidency, and uh, the Americans, I mean. In June, there was a major victory won in the Supreme Court in a case called Whole Women's Health, which is a, uh, some, several abortion clinics in Texas, versus Heller Stett, who I think is the Attorney General of Texas at the time. So Texas uh, had been a, on a years-long campaign to basically shut down all the abortion clinics in Texas. And they almost succeeded. I think there used to be 40, 50 clinics that got that reduced down to 20. And they did that by passing these absurd, onerous, ridiculous, unnecessary laws that forced clinics to go to a huge expense to, to meet. So things like um, upgrading to ambulatory surgical centers, so uh, basically hospital-grade infrastructure, which is not needed to provide abortions, which is a very simple procedure, even like even medical abortions, not even surgical. So uh, it uh, reg regulates things like the size of hallways, and you have to have a janitor's closet this is, so, this is so big, you have to have this many sinks, and uh, it's just ridiculous and not necessary at all. And another example, they call them trap laws. And another example of the a law that was struck down in Texas was, was admitting privileges, saying, all the abortion providers at the clinics had to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. And on its face, that sounds like kind of a reasonable requirement. But what happens is that in order to get admitting privileges, a doctor has to sort of guarantee a certain number of admissions per year. And that's impossible if you're an abortion provider, because you might have one admission every four or five years, because abortion is so safe. So doctors couldn't, uh, they would apply. And another problem uh, that happened was that a lot of the hospitals, the administration, were anti-choice. We're not giving you admitting privileges. Forget it. And so they would, get, they would be turned down by every hospital, and um, or they just wouldn't qualify. And it was actually very rare for a doctor to be able to obtain uh, admitting privileges. And they, they knew that. The legislators knew that, and that it would be an impossible barrier for clinics to meet. So um, the court luckily didn't buy all the anti-choice lies, saying, oh, we're doing it for women's health. and. And they even were making the argument, well, women near the border, they can just go across over to New Mexico for abortions. But of course, New Mexico had none of these requirements that Texas had been imposing. So it kind of exposed their women's health, health uh, argument as a real sham. Uh, so the court ruled that states can't impose overly burdensome regulations on abortion, which is, was a great decision because it really spelled out what an undue burden meant, which was uh, the current... Um, the current uh, sort of condition for an, uh, an abortion law was that it, it couldn't pose an undue burden. But what does that mean? So in, in practice, states were really interpreting that like liberally, like undue burden meant, um, meant nothing, really. So the courts clarified that, and they brought back scientific evidence into, into the court and um, looked at the actual evidence and found that, no, these laws do nothing to improve women's safety. And... Um, just to gear up and uh, for the Trump presidency, three new lawsuits have just been filed to fight state-level abortion restrictions. So it's a joint effort by the ACLU, Planned Parenthood Federation, and the Center for Reproductive Rights, which is um, a great group that, um, uh, of lawyers who fight uh, these cases, often on a pro, -no pro bono basis. So the laws that they took on um, uh, are a 20-week abortion ban in North Carolina, which is unconstitutional. In Alaska, there is a 40-year-old restriction limiting abortions to the first trimester. Forces women to travel out of state. Well, Alaska is a long, long ways from any other state. And Missouri restrictions, um, they're challenging Missouri restrictions that are very similar to the laws that were struck down in Texas. In fact, many of the states had similar laws to Texas, and some of the states have now backed down on them if the laws weren't quite passed yet. So that Texas decision is, is the one ace in the hole that, that we have to protect us in the coming years. So hopefully it will stand and, and serve as a, a, a bulwark against uh, some of the further anti-abortion restrictions. So if you're interested, there's a big, huge abortion march, or not abortion, but 
women's march on washington planned for the day after the inauguration on january twenty first that's the website women's march dot com there's already about one hundred fifty thousand people signed up just on facebook alone um, and i've i'm hearing a lot about it there's a lot of interest a huge amount of interest uh, people are angry and they're going now, of course washington around the inauguration is going to be a little bit crazy and there's going to be a lot of, you know, Republicans are down too. So uh, I encourage you to go if you want, but uh, try and arrange a stay with friends. Don't expect to get a hotel room. And there might be uh, solidarity marches. Uh, I think there will be in other cities across the U.S. and probably in Canada too. I don't know about Vancouver, but I heard there's going to be one in Toronto. This is the last slide, and I wanted to just sort of leave it with a few questions that we can think about and talk about during our discussion. Because I don't really know the answers to these myself, and uh, I don't want to speculate up here by, on my own. So my questions are, um, what are the chances that Trump can actually appoint at least two Supreme Court justices? Is it really going to happen? And even if he can, um, are those uh, justices really going to be able to, to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade? It's been a precedent for 44 years now. It can be hard to overturn precedent. How bad will things get, really, in the United States? Is, are we um, exaggerating? Is it, maybe Trump is not that bad, really? But how do we fight back? I mean, they have the power in, in both House of Congress and the House of Representatives. Um, they might have the Supreme Court. They certainly got the executive. What is it going to take to reduce Trump's impact if we can't fight back by, you know, uh, defeating his laws? And also, who's really going to wield the most power in this presidency? Is it going to be Trump himself? Or is he going to leave a lot of decisions, key decisions, to his extreme right-wing cabinet? Is Trump going to be more like a puppet, in other words? And will the U.S. cease to be the world's greatest superpower? There's been a lot of talk about the U.S. kind of like abandoning its uh, position on the world stage as a world leader. Other countries are going to have to take up the slack. I mean, China is an up-and-coming superpower. Are they going to suddenly take over? Like, what's going to happen? I mean, Trump is very isolationist and everything. He's going to be abandoning these international agreements, you know, climate change and so on, human rights obligations. So what is going to happen and where, where is that going to leave the U.S. and, and Americans? Thank you.